I've been doing youth ministry for 33 years. And I had a student come to me just a couple of years ago in seventh grade. And she was all upset, all anxious. And she, she said um, that there was something wrong with her. I said, well, what's wrong with you? She said that I am the only one in my class who doesn't have an anxiety disorder. And she was riddled with anxiety because of it. Today, we're going to focus on five key ways to seek God in situations and be an overcomer through scripture. And it's just, it's an epidemic in our society. All ages are experiencing tremendous stress. So um, I, I'm curious, right? If if the Bible is true, if the word of God is true, if, if Jesus is who he says he is, then we should be able to go to him with their anxiety and overcome these things. Uh, he's our savior, our rescuer. Um, the Holy Spirit's our, our sustainer, our advocate. So uh, your topic is so important because um, it actually reveals if the gospel is true or not in our broken world. Yeah. And so many teens today, they really need that. So parents that are struggling with their teens, this is um, such a great way to, you know, be engaged in our, in what we're talking about today. And also because you wrote this book, Make a Difference, Youth Bible. And so people can get this Bible and maybe it'll help the, the, the parents too, because I'm reading through it. I'm thinking, wow, there's some things in here. I, I would love to be, uh, know a little bit more about. And, um, you have something on prayer, you, you know, you go from old to new Testament. It, it's such a great engaging Bible. So, you know, from there, you know, do, do you regularly seek wisdom and direction from God's word? Yeah, you have to, uh, you know, in the middle of this anxious world, Nancy, here's, here's the key thing. I, I always try to remember the number one key thing. God is not panicking, right? Another way of saying that is God is not the panic King. So he's not, he's, he is not worried. He's not in heaven on his throne, chewing his fingernails, hoping that Nancy gets it all figured out, right? Um, I don't know what to do. I hope Nancy and Ken get it figured out on this phone call. He's not worried like that. He's yeah. not overcome by anxiety himself. And so we, it's just so good to remind ourselves that God is not panicking about what's going on in this world. I love Psalm 93 for that reason. Uh, his throne is established. And even though the, the seas have lifted up and they're pounding their waves against us, so to speak, uh, he is firmly established and he cannot be moved. And so if we're standing in him, uh, we can make it through. So that's my number one key takeaway for how to overcome anxiety is to first remember that God is not worried himself. You know, that's a real, that is the first time I've ever heard anybody say that. It, okay. It's absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And and he always makes a way, doesn't he? Always makes a way. Always makes a way. And so the, the number two suggestion I have is that we can give our worry to God because he's not panicking, because he is in control, then we can give our own worry, our own anxiety over to God. And it's interesting because Jesus actually says, don't worry about tomorrow because today has enough trouble, <laughs> right? Yes. Matthew 6. So it's it's not like it's it's a bad thing to have worry. In fact, we should have some anxiety and stress. Our world is broken and it's evidence that we need a savior, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's okay to have some worry and some stress, but what we do with that worry, how we handle it is, is where we can go off track or mm -hmm. where we can be in alignment with God. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is to, uh, second key thing is to give our worry to God. And a uh, mm -hmm. verse that we've already mentioned for that one I always go to is Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Um, and I, I remembered it in the NIV and it says, um, don't, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God will guard, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Right. So yeah. and I learned that in a time of, of worry myself when I was a teenager. So I was 17 or 18 
and just riddled with what am I going to do with my life? And why did this girl just break up with me? And all of these anxieties that I was experiencing at that time. And I treasured Philippians 4, 6, and 7 in my heart, took it to heart. And every time anxiety grew within me, I, I recited that verse to the Lord and trusted it to him. Um, with thanksgiving, knowing that he was hearing me, knowing that he was in charge, knowing that he had my good in mind for the long term. So that's my number two. One way to overcome anxiety and to help the next generation overcome anxiety is to surround yourself with a really good network of people. And the best network of people that there is, is the church. So this is a, a community of people, a, a church, if it's really acting the way it should, it's reflecting Jesus. It is concerned about others. It is generous in sharing so that needs are met. So if somebody is anxious because they are lacking something really important in their life, whether that's fellowship, whether that's income, whether that's um, uh, some counseling support, whether that's food on the table and a job, what, whatever it is, um, a church is the community, the best community in the world that seeks to supply those sorts of needs for people. Uh, Acts chapter two, it's what the, the first Christians did, the first church did in Jerusalem. Uh, they shared whatever they had with everyone else in that community and everyone's needs were met. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, uh, which kind of meant Bible, Bible study, and um, to the breaking of bread. So they shared meals together, and they remembered what Jesus had done for them. And then they just shared everything else they had. They sold extra things they had so they would have money to give to people. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think maybe some of our overwhelmed sense of anxiety today is because we live in a lot of isolation where we are disconnected from people in a true community, a true koinonia, a true fellowship. And I think the next generation doesn't know what that sort of experience can be like by and large. Mm -hmm. uh, youth groups are so important for this reason uh, because teenagers can learn to be surrounded by people who are like-minded, who uh, want to have friendship and mm -hmm. want to have experiences together. Uh, the problem is sometimes we have a hard time translating that youth group experience to the next stage of life mm -hmm. in in our the way we live our lives. So, and churches sometimes uh, segregate the generations too much, mm -hmm. and so young people feel isolated from older generations and then don't know how to break in after they mm -hmm. graduate. So our churches really can be more um, intentional about serving the needs of others because uh, our, our God supplies all of our needs. So that should always be in the core central uh, component of who we are as the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my last point to ask you is, is if we're worshiping and praising God, how do we focus on his greatness? Because we're, we're so easily distracted all the time, aren't we? We can, in worship, even when we have anxiety, we can be honest with God about that. We can praise God and say, God, I'm sorry I'm distracted right now. This is a burden I have. And you tell us to cast all of our burdens onto you. And in a way, that's a, that's a sense of worship. That's, mm -hmm. that's a posture of of praise to God. You're, you're giving him his rightful place of uh, lordship in your life, and you're offering your own weakness, so to speak, to him. You're surrendering that to him. So that's a great posture. So having the right posture day to day, I, I think that comes from spending time with Jesus. That would be one of the other key points that I have. If we go through life just focused on ourselves, um, we are going to be riddled with some self-centered worry and anxiety that we don't have to carry, right? Mm -hmm. So spending time with Jesus is important. He's our good shepherd. And Psalm 23, I love that. We, we have everything we need. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need, right? Yes. But to, but to live in that reality is really difficult. Mm 
So uh, Psalm 23 is wonderful. It says that he leads us beside quiet waters, he, in green pastures, he restores our soul. That all sounds so good, Nancy, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. And then he prepares a table for mm-hmm. us where a cup overflows. But we forget the context of that quite often. He leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. That sounds stressful and anxious to me. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. he prepares the table in the presence of enemies. Mm. So that sounds anxious and stressful to me. So Psalm 23 isn't a fairy tale. Psalm 23 is, hey, the world is difficult, but God is your shepherd. Jesus is your shepherd. So trust everything to him. Follow him. Be in proximity with him. Spend time with him. Don't wander away. Mm -hmm. And it seems like because he is leading us, a lot of our anxieties and burdens will be taken care of. Mm -hmm. They are there, but they will be addressed and taken care of. And as long as we're in his presence, everything is okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like that little child who is with their parent. Mm -hmm. And there can be a sea of anxiety going on around them, but they, if they're in the arms of their parent, everything's okay. So that's, I think that's how we should posture ourselves. Yes. In the arms of Jesus. And I love that you said that that was really good for someone to hear today because they really want to be in the arms of Jesus. They want to, they want to give their life over to him. And sometimes they just don't know how. And so like, I, I love what you said about posturing yourself. That's, that's great. So, um, you know, you just published a youth Bible called, you know, make a difference. Okay. Our youth Bible. And, and why would a parent choose this Bible? Yeah, it's a, it's a do something about your faith Bible, Nancy. So everything we've written in there has a prompt for young people to be active in their faith. Mm -hmm. And this might be the final point that, that we have about overcoming anxiety. When we coddle young people and don't challenge them to do hard things, then they uh, don't develop the skill sets, the character, the integrity, the practice of, mm. um, of overcoming things that they're worried about. And, and what's remarkable is that Jesus wants to empower us to change this world with mm. his gospel. And so everything we've put into this Make a Difference Youth Bible points mm. out how God is making a difference in our own lives. And then he spurs us, he, he works within us to go make a difference in the lives of others. So it's it's a wonderful opportunity uh, for young people to dive in and be really authentic and real and active mm-hmm. and raw about their faith. So I sometimes call it a, a loud time Bible. So I call the Make a Difference Youth Bible a loud time Bible because it's not a quiet time that you you just take and you absorb for yourself and you just keep it quiet and... and um, just introspective. So teenagers are like filled with this desire to do something. They want to be. They want to be called to to be important and meaningful, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so this this Bible is a loud time Bible because it gets you off your couch and it gets you to to do things. So if the Bible says that you should um, care for widows, then it prompts you to, hey, contact a local nursing home or go rake the leaves of an older person's yard or shovel their, we're in Minnesota, so shovel their driveway in the winter. So go actually help people. If it, if it says to um, tame your tongue and to use it in good ways and not profane ways, it actually prompts you to practice saying only good things today and mm-hmm. and uh catch yourself anytime you say something negative out of your mouth so it it really is a it's a prompting do something active based commentary in this bible you know for years you've been doing this uh working with the youths and um there are so many lost kids right now so many mm-hmm. lost kids um what would you say to a parent right now that's really struggling with their either their grandchild or their own child um how would you give them hope that you know they they could they could change a direction for this child yeah well I, I would say that jesus loves your child even more than you so so remember that and god is already at work in their life so 
cast that burden to the Lord, but, but do that every day. Let the Lord know that you are in partnership with what the Lord is wanting to do in that child's life. That's important. Secondly, I would say that uh, the older generation can model for the next generation how to live life through anxiety. So mm-hmm. if the if the older generation is is coddling themselves, so to speak, if they're avoiding stressful situations by by um, doing some improper behaviors or not dealing with things in a healthy way. The next generation learns those same practices and then usually takes it one step further, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So the older generation can really model how to behave, how to care for others, how to have the right mindset in difficult moments. So the, we mentioned, Nancy, we mentioned Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I, I think it's it's such a wonderful thing that that chapter, Philippians 4, Paul also talks about having contentment in all circumstances, whether mm-hmm. he's got everything he needs or whether he's lacking everything. Um, and then Philippians 4, 8 and 9 also give us like a really practical um, step to take to overcome anxiety. It says that we should fix our thoughts on whatever is good, noble, admirable, praiseworthy, trustworthy, We should fix our thoughts on those things because ultimately those things all are the character of Jesus. Mm -hmm. All of those qualities, those those qualities are what Jesus is made up of. So that's who he is. So in other words, fix your thoughts on Jesus, fix your thoughts on, on all the good things that he is, and that will help you change your mind frame as you as you model how to get through these difficult seasons. Mm-hmm. Oh, can I add one more thing to that? It's of so course. good. The Bible is so good. The Bible really is our best resource for overcoming anxiety. I, I think often of Psalm 1. It says that those who meditate on the ways of the Lord, the laws of the Lord day and night, mm-hmm. that they'll be like a tree planted by a stream and they will be strong and flourishing in every season. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I take that to heart. So mm-hmm. if we if we really do spend time in God's word, we will become like a tree that is strong and flourishing in every season. It's planted by a stream of living water. It's its roots grow deep. Its trunk grows strong and its branches overflow with all the fruitfulness and all of the the shading and all of the provision of God. And um, this really is the picture that scripture provides for us. Mm -hmm. So I I would encourage the older generation, moms, dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles, neighbors, that they um, can pray for the next generation, Mm -hmm. but they can also model for the next generation uh, the right kind of priorities, the right kind of mind thinking, and, um, and let the next generation see that in you. So my my last question to you before we close would be, have you seen a child um, turn around from, say, you know, coming in and just being so lost and shut down to God just totally changing that child? Absolutely. Yeah. Dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Uh, that's one of the joys of youth ministry. Uh, there are some tragedy stories where where it seems like people just go in the wrong direction for the rest of their lives, but but there are so many redemptive stories. I love working with teenagers for that reason. So uh, I've seen many people whose parents who thought that their kid was just absolutely lost to this world, and um, I've seen I've seen kids uh, find Jesus and find a footing and have their lives restored, and then tell an amazing story that helps others um, find Jesus as well. The the trick, so to speak, Nancy, though, is that God will do that in his timing, not usually the timing of the parents, <laughs> right? Because Romans 5 is true. Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. And a lot of times, this is this is maybe a key principle for overcoming anxiety. 
a lot of times we want to go right from suffering to hope, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Just, Lord, just give me hope. And we're in the middle of difficult moments. We're in the middle of worry about our child. But in reality, God has a formula for this broken world. And, and in faithfulness, um, we often need to go through a time of perseverance. So through severance, per severance, perseverance, we've got to go through a difficult time and God wants to work in our hearts and develop some, some character, some integrity, some grit of mm-hmm. trust to him and let, let his qualities start to come through in our life so we can model that and, and live it out. And then a hopefulness will spring out from there because God is not done working. He will he will bring to completion good work that he starts, right? So um, we can trust our children to the Lord. And first and foremost, though, our job is to live for the Lord ourselves. Mm-hmm. So my la- I know I said my last question, but now I have to ask <laughs> you one more. I have to ask you one more. What if, what if somebody wants to get something started in their church? How, tell me how you would tell them how to get it started. Well, I would empower young people to do risky things. Uh, they they have a high calling. So the Lord has used the next generation again and again and again. So empower your children's ministry people, empower youth ministry people, uh, leaders and volunteers to empower the next generation to lead in mm-hmm. faith, in ministry. So give them opportunities that might seem risky. Uh, give them opportunities to give a message or a devotional for the church. I uh, encourage a teenager to start a Bible study or a prayer group at their school. Um, encourage them to, to plan out a missions trip. Uh, start, start letting them be uh, elders or deacons in training for the church. So mentor them to do difficult things. If, if you're going to do a food drive, get teenagers involved to lead it. You know, one thing we know is that when when the next generation gets up and is excited about their faith, the whole church gets excited about their faith. And so one of the best things you could actually do for your church is to empower the next generation. So I would say provide um, challenging and risky is important, risky leadership opportunities, stuff that if it went wrong, it could actually hurt something. (laughs) Now, Now, temper it. (laughs) <laughs> like have have the safety protocols in place, right? Yeah. But um, we trust fifteen year olds or sixteen year olds to get behind the wheel steering wheel of a car while we're sitting next to them. Uh, that's a dangerous, risky thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, every parent's got to go through that process, and yet sometimes we are a little reserved little cautious and we're mm-hmm. overprotective and coddling and we won't let teenagers have risky leadership. Nancy, the Bible is filled with God letting 12 year olds do amazing things, right? Yeah. So I think of David fighting Goliath or um, uh, young, young people doing incredible things. Um, the disciples, many of them were, were teenagers yeah, when they John were following was. Jesus. Yeah. Certainly he was. And I, I often argue that he was probably 12 when he started following Jesus. Wow. That's, a, that's an age where they went into um, either the trades or they went into rabbinical school. And mm-hmm. Jesus as a rabbi is grabbing a hold of John who's just starting to fish. And Jesus is like, hey, come follow me. And John's like, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> So, but we can, I, I would say, just find some, find some young people that, that are wanting to follow God and empower them with incredible opportunities. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you can get this book, Make a Difference, um, and it, you can find it on uh, Ken's uh, website. It's kencaster.com, and I'll put that here in the, um, in the notes, and um also on social media, what social media accounts, what are they called and how can they find Yeah, They could look up make a difference Bible and that'll show up on Instagram, Facebook, uh, make a difference Bible.com. They could also go there and find every store that it's sold in. So, yep. Wonderful. And what would you like to leave my audience with today? Uh, Just maybe that reminder that we started with that God is not panicking. So trust your cares to him. 
And uh, he's got an, an amazing plan through Jesus for this world. So um, you can be a beacon of hope in that way. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts on our conversation by putting your comments below and visit the call with nancycebedo.com to learn more about me and what we do here on the ministry. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share. Your support means so much to us.